Hello everyone, this is Axum from Fire Ambrose, and today on Limited Deployment, we're going to be talking about how to tackle Iron Man game challenges in Fire Emblem. A lot of the information I'm going to give to you now actually overlaps that of how to tackle Maddening Mode. So if there are a couple of repetitions, don't be mad. It's just one of those things that actually happens in both of them because some of those practices are really good in either mode that you're going to be playing. The first thing I want to talk about and the most important aspect of an Iron Man is to understand that when an Iron Man occurs, you cannot reset if a character dies. That means that you must continue the game until the very end and the objective is to complete the game. If a character dies at any point in time, you can't reset to save them and they must stay dead. More importantly, if your Lord dies, then the game is over and you have to restart the entire game. So the death of your Lord is directly tied to failing the Iron Man. That being said, the first rule that I want to talk about in How to Iron Man is also the most important rule in How to Iron Man. It's going to be protect your Lord. Now, this does not mean do not use your Lord. This does not mean do not invest in your Lord. What it means is that do not take unnecessary risks with your Lord. If your Lord has a 75% chance of hitting something or he dies on the enemy phase, you shouldn't be risking him out there. You should not even be putting him remotely close to a scenario like that. Your Lord is going to be the most important character throughout your entire playthrough because your loss is directly attached to his existence. Oh -ho! Your Lords like Micaiah, Roy, Erica are going to have a harder time and they're going to need to be babied a lot more. This also has a double-edged sword in your advantage. It means that any and all investment that you dump into your main lord will always be of use. One time in one of my Iron Mans, I actually managed to succeed because Roy was going to die, but he actually survived because I had given him an angelic rope. So investment into your main lord is always going to be worth it from any perspective in an Iron Man, and you should also always protect them. Do not put them in danger. Number two. Know the game that you're Iron Manning. What do I mean by this? Play it a lot before you try an Iron Man? You don't need to memorize absolutely everything, but I definitely recommend always having a guide next to it to show you where reinforcements come from or which turns they come from. There's no shame in that, so that you can plan accordingly or know what to take into that chapter. The hardest chapter of each Iron Man is always going to be the chapter that you're currently on, because if you don't beat it, the game's over. That being said, also pay attention to the objectives. In Radiant Dawn, there are actually a lot of chapters that are route as quickly as 12 turns or something of the sort. So you have to pay attention in order that you don't fail the game because you didn't complete the objective. Since we're talking about one map at a time, I also want to bring up resource management. Remember, Fire Emblem is a resource management game before anything else. Which means that you need to tackle each map one at a time to try to solve the problems of those maps given the resources that you have currently. Let's say a map is full of siege tomes. And if a Siege Tome is going to be a problem because it can target your lower stat Lord or it can kill a unit that you really need to or kill a Glass Cannon or something, it might be more useful to expend a Warp Staff or a Rescue Staff to actually go in quickly, kill out the Siege Tome, and then pull back out. This is actually one of the strategies I use the most. I just immediately try to deal with Siege Tomes as quickly as possible or Siege Ballista so that they stop becoming a problem and creates more space for my units to be able to occupy. If I don't do this, the enemy AI basically dictates how far up I can move ahead and what I can control because the space is blocked out by whatever the range of the Siege Tome is. In one particular example that I have, in my FV6 Iron Man run, on the chapter The Silver Wolf, where you have two double boltings and the killer ballista, I actually warped Deke in so that he could kill one of the bolting guys and he died due to the other bolting guy and the killer ballista hitting him. I do not regret this in the slightest. I know it sounds strange. Taking away that threat from the siege tomes allowed me to push up, effectively beat the chapter with minimal losses. So in certain ways, Deke, you were the hero we needed. Speaking of pre-promotes, pre-promotes in Iron Man are even more valuable due to the fact that they don't take up any investment whatsoever of the experience that could be going to units that can hard carry your run. Pent, or some of the stronger ones, Milady, you have also Har in Fire Emblem 10. These units are actually really good that allow you a lot of maneuverability to be able to 
allocate resources, and to deal with enemies that usually you won't be able to deal with. Seth is a prime example of a pre-promote that just absolutely dominates from beginning to end of the game. And albeit Sacred Stone's hard mode isn't the hardest Iron Man out there, in fact it's considered one of the easiest, it's actually not as trivial as you would believe with multiple points of the game being able to actually take you out of commission. But even if you invested a lot into a character and they died, you can still complete the game. I absolutely promise you. This happened to me in my FE9 playthrough. Jill got hit with a sleep staff, which lowers her dodge ability to zero. And at that point, she was level 16, promoted Draco Knight with full guard, all the good stuff that you could imagine, along with the stun. So I gave her an occult scroll. She was loaded. But unfortunately, she fell to the barrage of bows from Cav Knights on the Clash chapter. I still continued on to beat the game with no more losses after that point besides her which means the game can be completed regardless of you losing anybody. Speaking of characters that you don't want to lose, I'm going to go ahead and address the elephant in the room. The Dancer and the Thief are the most likely classes that you will lose in an Iron Man. And I'm telling you, I know this from experience. Almost every single Iron Man I've done, I have lost a Thief at some point. Thieves are notoriously bad. Their only purpose is to open a door or get a chest or something of the sort or steal and they're not even useful for combat. The dancers on the other hand are completely useful. They are probably the best characters in the game. Granting another action to another character or the best character that you need in that moment. If you plan out your dancers moves that's even better. However they come with the problem of not being able to do combat and of being super fragile as well. Protect your dancer at all costs. In my recent FE10 run I actually did not count the squares because you know FE10 doesn't have range check which is a fantastic decision. So Rayson was actually in range of a lonely Lance Cavalier, and he killed him. But I still went on to complete the game, even though Rayson died. But that being said, I strongly recommend that you start valuing the idea of buying chest keys and door keys so that you don't have to deploy a thief in order to get the resources from that map. Some maps, you don't even need to necessarily get all the chests or open all the doors or fight all the enemies. So you need to balance what it is that you actually want to take out of each chapter. So I strongly recommend reevaluating what door keys and chest keys can contribute to your army. I also never recruited Heather in my FE10 Iron Man. And guess what? Still beat the game. Another aspect that I want to bring up is that you do not need to take risky chances in an Iron Man. If you're setting up an assault, let's say, in which you want to try to wipe out enemies on player phase, and you start realizing that your hit rates are kind of shaky between 75 to 80 percent, and you take a chance and it doesn't work, you better best have a way to get out of there. There is one rule that I live by in every single Iron Man that I ever do. When in doubt, pull out. What does that mean? You just need to be able to retreat as quickly as possible if you don't think that you can 100 percent execute the strategy that you want to do. You do not want to take chances in Iron Man. The reality is if the RNG reads 75, you should be interpreting this as an absolute chance of failure. Why? Because odds are it can fail. And when it does fail, it's gonna be such a detriment to your strategy that you're actually just gonna outright lose. And then you're gonna sit there and be like, oh man, the RNG really screwed me over. No, you did. You screwed yourself over. Why? because you didn't plan accordingly. You have to plan for the possibility of things going wrong, and you have to plan for the possibility of having things that you didn't expect occur. Now that's, that's a weird statement to say, but what it means is that you have to be able to fall back to a position in which you can actively challenge the next turn. Every decision you make has to be either a guarantee or a setup for a guarantee. Another thing that's important to note is the fact of status staves. I call them the triple S, the stupid status staves. In the GBA era, this is more prominent and probably for like Thracia and genealogy, but the reality is that status saves are absolutely busted when they're in the enemy hands for most games. In your hand, I only really see that engage and three houses made staves really good, status effects staves really good in the hand of the player. You gotta be really wary of staves such as sleep, berserk, and silence. Those three in particular can end a run if you're not paying attention. So before you start any map, I want you to just scroll through all the enemy inventories to see what they got and then partake and react accordingly to that map. The Berserk Staff will end a run. So you always have to counter the idea of 
what if my guy that's supposed to cleanse Berserk gets Berserked? And that's a question that you should be asking, which means games like FV6, stave users that can perform cleanses are actually much more valuable, and you're going to always want to field a lot of them in case you're afraid of one of them getting silenced or Berserk, and a lot of maps have this overlapping. So I want you to really pay attention to status staves, how they can affect your movement, and how they can affect your outcome in a battle. Another thing that people don't really notice is that, say FE10, sleep staves actually reduce your dodge rate. One time, my Ike got slapped and just got absolutely clobbered by Siege Tomes and killed. So there's a combination of two things I talked about. Siege Tomes destroying him and sleep staves destroying him. Guess what? The next time I played, I made sure to take out those Siege Tomes as quick as possible. Ike still got slapped because the sleep stave was very, very far off, but this time he didn't die. I definitely recommend that you do not split your army unless you are absolutely sure that the units that you split off can survive. Nothing comes to mind better as an example of this as FE9. Ike and Oscar have one of the best supports in the game, giving them a ton of avoid. Sometimes I would split them both off so that they would fight off hordes of enemies by just killing everything in sight. This worked because I knew that both of them could survive given their Ether and Saul abilities and the fact that they had a high dodge rate consistently to be able to deal with the enemies. If you're not sure about this, there is no need to split up your army at all. As a matter of fact, the closer your army is together, the more likely it is that you'll have turns to react and to be able to cleanse or be able to rescue your characters as long as they are together. You really, really want to be able to make your units close by so they can benefit from supports, from being able to reach each other, and so on and so forth. Another thing I want to talk about is the units that are worth investing. Knowing the gross versus basis concept. Usually, at the higher levels of gameplay, meaning lunatic, maddening, and so on and so forth, Units are usually characterized as either growths or basis units, sometimes a utility unit thrown in there. Like something like Nimi is not really a growth or basis, although she has fantastic basis, but she's more of like a utility bot. The thing I want to bring to your attention is you really want to make sure that you're distributing experience well. And I'm not meaning equally, I'm meaning well. You don't want to raise an army of babies for endgame, given that the majority of the difficult chapters are probably in the beginning and in the middle of the game. Endgame can be done usually with pre-promotes that arrive anyway, but the hardest part of the games are either the sections that have <laughs> units against strong units. So it's usually the early game and the mid game of any Iron Man. And I'm not saying to not bring people from the early game, what I'm saying is pick one or two that you really like or can really contribute. Hint hint, usually it's a flyer that can do a lot of mobility stuff as well. And make that one the unit that you're going to invest in. And then later on, fill on those roles with pre-promotes that are more than capable of completing it. Something like Kagetsu comes into mind. Absolutely busted destroying units since the moment that he comes in. Why not use him? One thing that's a lot overlooked inside Fire Emblem Iron Man's as well is the value of the items in your inventory. Now, usually people think like, why am I going to use a vulnerary? Like it wastes a turn or whatever. The truth is, don't hold on to these items. You're going to get a bunch of them anyway. You might as well just use them as you progress so that you can get the biggest value out of them. Vulneraries are there so that if your unit can't perform any action that's going to contribute to your combat, you're just going to chug a vulnerary to make sure you don't waste a healer's turn. That's how I want you to start seeing it. Let's say your Marth took 15 damage and he has 35 HP. And you're walking around, Marth can't reach anybody. The best option is probably to heal other people since he has the vulnerary so you conserve that action. He's not going to do anything anyway. He'll chug that vulnerary, recover a little bit of HP, make him a little bit more safe, and then you go to heal another unit with your healer to, to create turns. So you're basically using it as a turn management thing. Do not underestimate the power of pure water. Pure water is the most underrated item in the game, in any Fire Emblem game. Plus 7 to resistance is absolutely nuts. Something like Marcus from Fire Emblem 6, who has a pretty good resistance stat. You go ahead and you add a pure water to him, this man has now become a destroyer of mages. Mages cannot even touch him. Even if they do, it's very little damage, and he can penalize them with 1-2 range on return. Absolutely busted. Pure water is so powerful, it also increases against chances of being affected by status staves. There is no reason not to have it. When you get an option to buy up pure water so you can use them on your units, you should. Your unit's not doing anything, oh, I'll just pop up pure water. You don't use it, obviously, if you're not going to fight any mages, but if you get doubled, you effectively took 14 less damage 
it's just always better to avoid that damage altogether. Which is why Ward Staff is actually pretty good as well. It's basically a walking pure water that you put on your Staff Healer and they get experience conserving their turn. And let's be honest, the Staff Healers aren't usually doing combat, so what better way to support than that? I also recommend that you do the following in any Iron Man run. You devise a strategy before each map of how you're trying to tackle that map and you invest the resources accordingly. There is one mistake that people usually make in Iron Man that leads to the famous soft lock problem. They don't take into account the boss or a very strong enemy that they need to deal with and they don't field anything that's capable of dealing with it. You must have an answer to every single problem on the map. Say an example of this is Degincia in Fire Emblem 10. Everybody knows that this guy has absolutely bonker stats. Before even fighting him, you have to think about the possibility that maybe nobody will do damage to him. And then you sit and think on the fact that, wait a minute, this man has ire, meaning that he can actually one tap any unit that does not have Nihil in case it procs. Are you gonna go and gonna attack him thinking that maybe Iron won't proc? No, that violates one of our rules. We have to make sure that we don't take risky chances. RNG is not at fault, you are. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna tackle him only with people that have Nihil. And you have to have strong enough characters that are able to tackle and fight him without dying on the enemy phase as well. I need you to, before you even engage in that map, start mapping out the solutions to the problems on the map. If it's siege tomes, aggressively push up and take out those siege tomes or silence people or entrap them, whatever. If it's a boss, make sure to field the correct weaponry to defeat the boss. If it's recruiting a specific character, make sure we know how to tackle that specific character quickly to get him. Planning is about 90% of the Iron Man battle. My last advice to you, and this is kind of like the Debbie Downer of the whole thing, is know when to restart. What do I mean by this? Let's say you're early on in your Iron Man for FE8. And let's say that Seth dies in Chapter 4 of your Iron Man. You could be tempted to continue. And for the most part, I'd be like, yeah, you could probably complete the game anyways. But the truth is, sometimes you just gotta cut your losses and know when to back out. In this case, your run is probably better off if you try again, reset since it's so early on, and push forward. This time, taking care of whatever it was that killed Seth to begin with. Iron Man challenges are self-imposed, meaning that they're just there so that you can complete it for your own amusement or for other people's amusements if you're streaming and whatnot. Don't get frustrated, it happens. A lot of stuff happens sometimes that's out of your control or you didn't think about it or you're like, oh man, I didn't see that coming. One of the classic effects of this is what I call the snowball killing, right? Which is basically, you put a unit to block a choke, then that unit dies. And then once that unit dies, the other units start pouring in and just absolutely massacring everybody behind them. This is called the snowball effect. It is probably the most detrimental <laughs> effect that can happen in Iron Man because it's absolutely demoralizing. You lose a bunch of people because of one misplay. So my advice to you is actually try to avoid the snowballing effect at all points. Really make sure that whoever is holding a choke is ironclad capable of surviving, which means doing a lot of math regarding the enemy's attack stats and your defensive stats so that you can basically calc how much damage you're gonna take and the possibility of you dying. But for the most part, you will always be able to find out a solution that is guaranteed and that will work for you as long as you bring the right resources in to deal with them adequately. Once again, I really wanna point out that you guys should be having fun with this that you should be just focusing on your enjoyment. Not be frustrated if you fail a couple of runs. It's okay, it happens to everyone. I do recommend playing the game a lot before you try doing the Iron Man. And I am 100% confident that every single person watching this video right now is capable of completing an Iron Man on any difficulty they desire as long as they focus on it and know how to tackle it correctly. I wanna thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate the feedback that comes in. I hope this video helped you and encouraged you to be able to tackle your Iron Man. And I hope to see it soon, actually. Please leave down below in the comments any more advice that you think would be fantastic for people doing Iron Mans. And I hope to see you next time. This has been Axum from Fire Ambrose. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and have a wonderful day.